Section 7 of The Sins of Hollywood by Ed Roberts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Wonderful Lover. What a lover! Doesn't he just make you tingle all over? cried the foolish wife of a prominent citizen. Oh, what wouldn't I give to go through that last scene with him, where he hugs her as only he can hug? When I think of that kiss, my head gets light, chirruped the idle spouse of the local usurer. Well, girls, those kisses and wonderful embraces are easy enough to get, if you have the price remarked the big woman who had sat between them. She had been doing comedy characters at the studios ever since pictures were pictures. She traveled in the train of the prosperous pair because she told raw stories rawly, was witty and clever, was their connecting link with the movies. They had nothing else to think of, no washing to do, and besides, her cozily furnished bungalow on the edge of the foothills came in handy at times. Very, very handy. I'd be willing to pay. He can have me any time he wants me. You only live once, said Mrs. Usurer. What my husband don't know won't hurt him, said Mrs. Prominent Sit. And besides, I've got enough on him to make him look sick. If ever Adolfo comes my way, watch me grab. <laughs> You're both wrong, girls, laughed the big woman. I don't mean what you mean. That's easy. Any woman can give that. When I said price, my good women, I meant cash. Spoon Deluxe, Mazuma, Golden Ducats. What do you mean? cried both in a breath. I mean, children, that Adolfo has put a cash value on what he's got. He accommodates the ladies at so much per accommodate. Or, well, you can have his service by the week, month, or hour. It's all according to how you feel. Right now? cried Mrs. Prominent Citizen and Mrs. Usurer in chorus. <laughs> now, girls, don't get excited. Don't be foolish. Right now, mimicked the big woman. Right now, he's a great star. The mamas and the papas all over this dry nation fight like cave women to get good seats whenever and wherever his love making appears on the screen. He does not have to live the old way any more. He's just like the successful bucket shop operator in the high finance class. Probably contributes to the fun to clean up the bucket shops or the lounge lizards. Take your pick. All right, tell us the whole story, teacher, said Mrs. Prominent Citizen. Yes, please, teacher, implored Mrs. Usurer. Time was, began the big woman, when our hero was not as prosperous as he is today. He wasn't very prominent, nodding toward Mrs. Prominent Sit. And he did not have any money to loan out at high rates of interest, nodding toward Mrs. Usurer. So he had to do the best he could. Now it happened that the boy had brains in his feet, as well as his head. Also, he had no scruples. No scruples at all. Adolfo was what they call a dancing fool. The dancing part was okay, but they were wrong on the fool. Very, very wrong. With his little old dress suit, that was his wardrobe, he came to Pasadena. 
there was in Pasadena in those days, just as there is now, a group of hotels that were as swell as, as, hell. The papas and the mamas of the war babies, the sugar guys, the oil guys, the munition guys, all that bunch came there to play. And more often than not, mama had to come alone because papa had to stay home and nurse little war baby. And this made mama a very lonesome and a very miserable woman. So that every night at the ultra, ultra hotel misery land and the also ultra, ultra hotel Wantington, there were sundry women, not too good looking, not too fair of form, nor too young, who sat by the sidelines and enviously eyed the young girls, who had no difficulty in securing partners. What good were their diamonds and their gold embroidered dresses and their limousines and everything when they couldn't get them a dancing partner? So there was gloom, deep impenetrable gloom and disappointment among the mamas of the war babies. Then along came little Dolphy. His appraising eyes surveyed the field. He saw what he saw. The diamonds did not blind him. In the dazzling light, he only opened his eyes all the wider. He looked over the young ones, and he looked over the old ones. For the time being, at least until after the campaign was over, he determined to turn his back on the flappers. They would have to wait. He pulled no boners. He was a bright young man. He danced the old girls dizzy. He started out by dancing with the young ones and flirting with the old ones over his partner's shoulders. No, he was not bold. This was work that called for a certain kind of finesse. No matter how much he needed them, he must hold tight until they came after him. You see, you see, Adolfo had once read the story of Potiphar's wife and how she chased little Joseph, a nice Jewish boy with black eyes and pretty hair, all over her husband's preserves, just because Joseph handled the proposition right. He made her come after him. Them Jews have always been good businessmen, he said to himself. Wherefore, he planned his campaign along Josephian lines. He made them come after him. Well, he danced and he danced, and it wasn't long before he had the rivals for his attention glaring at one another and saying little spiteful things about, and often right to, each other. The young girls laughed and sneered, and the old girls cried in the privacy of their rooms whenever they didn't get their full share of dances with him. And believe me, the boy could dance. He made every dowager think she had it on Mrs. Vernon Castle. My, but he was the popular boy. There is no use prolonging this story too much, children. Adolfo was going great. Funds were getting very, very low when the contest came to a climax. The rivalry for his favors narrowed down to just two contestants. One was the wife of a very rich Easterner. She had come to Pasadena a month or two before with her young daughter. They occupied a lavishly appointed apartment near the misery land. The other was the more or less well-known wife of a gay blade, whose people had amassed millions in the packing game. Wherever people eat, her husband's family draws revenue. 
For some time, he played them both. On one occasion, he rode home with the pair in a big limousine. They met the next day, said the one from the east. Dolphy was wonderful last night. He squeezed my hand all the way home. That was when he wasn't squeezing mine, snapped the other. Finally, the lady from the east forged to the front and took possession of Adolfo. He lived well, had plenty of money, and prospered. The apartment was cozy and comfortable, and there was always room for him. This lasted until the woman who ran the apartment house decided things were getting a little bold. The lady was asked to move, which she did, and Adolfo went along. But the time came for going home, and her husband's insistence could be overcome no longer. She departed sorrowingly. After that, it was one after another. He was making a good living. He finally began to drift over to Los Angeles. He enlarged his territory. He became a four o'clock tea hound at the principal downtown hotel. He walked about the lobby with his hat off, was thoroughly at home. The four o'clock teas were patronized by a group of women whose husbands bored them, and a few young girls who didn't care. He found many patrons here, and basked in the sunshine of success and plenty. On one occasion, a florist who had received a bad check from Adolfo went over to the hotel, where he had been informed he spent his afternoons. He found him and demanded payment in no uncertain terms. Dolphy asked him to wait. But the florist followed him into the tea room, and there our hero whispered a word or two to a sportive looking matron and came back smiling with the money to make good the check. Then Dolphy met a movie girl. She was just on the edge of stardom, just going over the top. She helped him. Then she married him. That was his entry into pictures. He had done a few bits, but was comparatively unknown. With the opportunities and the personal contact his marriage gave him, Adolfo moved fast. He met the right people. He had talent. Brains in both head and feet. His opportunity came, and he took advantage of it. He could act, had been acting all his life. That's how he lived. His lessons in lovemaking stood him in good stead. All he had to do was be natural. When he finally hit the high mark, he didn't need the movie girl anymore. She was a liability now not an asset. So he canned her. Her career is about ended. His is just beginning. He draws a fat salary. His lovemaking is an art. He learned it in a great school and was paid while learning. He's a big star. Nice girls and nasty ones are all in the same boat. They all love Dolphy's way of loving. End of section seven.